uh, labor and social development. You have chaired the the uh, the track and the, the country director uh, K International um, assisted and the IFAD was the anchoring agency. And lastly, the action uh, program number five was on building resiliency uh, to vulnerabilities, shocks, and stresses. And the Ministry of Local Government took a lead, assisted by uh, uh, OPM. And then WFP uh, was the anchoring agency. So this, you know, um, discussed a lot of important issues about uh, our food systems in this country, and that's where the pathways that, um, and national pathways and commitments were actually built. So, um, in order for us to have a uh, transformed the, you know, our food system, there was need to do the uh, strategic analysis. First of all, you know very well that the NDP3 is coming to an end, and the, at the moment, we are uh, having uh, NDP for being prepared, and all I think the strategic um, activities have been identified. So, in order to ensure uh, that the NDP uh, that the activities are included in the NDP four, and also uh, to have the, um, to ensure the feasibility of Ugandan commitments, there was the um, establishment of the Food Systems Transformation Action Plan by government. So uh, uh, this creation required now the strategic analysis of uh, the four important areas, the three important areas. The, uh, the, uh, first of all, the policy, legal, and institutional frameworks, the human resource capacity, and then the finance and budgetary aspects, which are surrounding food systems. We believe that these three areas are very, very important when it comes to transforming uh, food systems. And what should actually be done in each of these areas? What uh, key game changers are required, you know, uh, so that the, the food system can be uh, transformed? So that was the, the justification for the strategic analysis. So the objectives definitely were centered on, the, on those uh, three uh, activities. Uh, so we had to conduct analysis in each of those three um, areas. Okay, the approach that was used uh, was such that uh, each of those three areas, you know, there was the lead MDA that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, that was uh, appointed by the National Food Systems Coordination Committee. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 smart, the, the strategic smart area on policy, regulatory, and social frameworks was actually led by uh, Minister of Agriculture. And then uh, uh, the human resource architecture was led by the Minister of um, Public Service, and then budget financing and social mobilization, National Planning Authority took a lead. But overall, coordination was done by OPM. Um, so uh, the three consultants which I've shown there um, undertook a number of activities in order to come up with a strategic analysis. First of all, there was a comprehensive literature review you know, to establish what has been published on each of these three areas to compare with the current situation. And then uh, there was stakeholder mapping and engagements to find out who should actually be interviewed, who should provide the relevant information about to, uh, each of these uh, areas. So this included the public, private, and uh, um, of course, um, uh, you know, the UN agencies. And even beyond Uganda, where we interviewed the, uh, you know, people from Comesa and the African Union, how have they actually achieved the food systems transformation? Then there were consultative meetings, which were conducted both at national and the regional levels. When I talk about regional levels, I mean the, uh, the East, Central, South, and Northern Uganda. So we went to all those regions and obtained the information from stakeholders. Uh, right from the, uh, you know, grassroots, the local governments, and they provided us with very good ideas, which we are now synthesized the, uh, later. We also had the best practices and case studies to compare with the, what exactly is existing. And then uh, uh, we had to, to summarize the information, most of which was actually um, uh, uh, qualitative. So we had to do a lot of triangulation to get meaningful uh, you know, information out of it. And then each of the consultants came up with a full report, and afterwards we consolidated the three reports into 
one. The best summary, you know, which actually talks about the key game changers, which I'm going to uh, present right now. I was given 10 minutes to present this, but the uh, Father Chairman, I don't know whether you allow me to, con to continue. Um, so, this, uh, the game changers that I'm going to show you, you know, are, are based on the five action tracks. So each of the game changers, you know, had the policies, you know, which policies should be done, what should be done in terms of the human, you know, capacity, in terms of financing, and then the outcomes that we, uh, we achieved. So when we consider action track number one, uh, access to safe and nutritious food for all, you know, we feel that there's a need to strengthen the food safety and quality control systems. If it is not safe, it is not food meaning that once food safety is not addressed, we don't have food systems at all. So in, in there, uh, we talk about several issues that are supposed to be you know, emphasized from the legal, from the policy, from the institutional framework point of view, and also from the human resource and the money. We need to develop um, improved food-based commodity markets at the district level, harness productivity and competitiveness. We are seeing now markets being, you know, um, built, well-organized markets at the, uh, for example, in the, most of these urban areas. What about at the district level? Our people are, you know, are finding difficulties supplying, you know, good goods to clear markets. So they cannot be actually, uh, they cannot compete. And in that way, access, you know, to food, good food becomes a problem. There's need to upscale irrigation-based food production systems at the national and district level. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know well that the, uh, our agriculture is rain-fed. Uh, once, it, it, um, once there's no rain, means that the crop actually fails completely. And some, by the way, last year I was uh, confused because there was excessive rainfall. And the farmers in my area where I come from went to church to pray for rain to stop so that they could dry their produce. I got confused. But if, uh, all that we are talking about uh, is that the, uh, we need to have irrigation systems in place so that in the case of drought, we have actually continuous crop being uh, produced. There's a need to, um, to I think, digitalize uh, actually the extension services, e-extension e services, very, very important. We have got the digital systems in place, but they are insufficient. We need to scale them up so that the communication becomes easier. The extension staff can communicate to farmers what is exactly happening and what they are supposed to do using these phones and using these social media. Scale up uh, supply, consumption, and monitoring of fortified, you know, and the biofortified foods. The, micro, the issue of micronutrients. If you are to access, you know, nutritious food, I think this issue of both the industrial fortification and the the uh, biofortification are very very important to enhance, you know, uh, these foods. Uh, we need to increase the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. I think this was talked about, uh, you know, uh, this morning. These are very, very good sources of micronutrients. And then I institute a price control mechanism to, to, have, to, you know, to allow access, you know, uh, everybody to have access, at least access to high, you know, nutritional value food, which is very, very important. So action track number two, uh, shift to sustainable uh, consumption patterns. How do we do that? Uh, it is important that we, um, um, no. there's a need to implement um, a government-led, countrywide, homegrown school feeding program. We realized that even this morning it was talked about school feeding is very, very important. And the, the, the nature of the food that actually our children eat, quite insufficient. You know, many of them drop out, many of them perform badly because of that. So if there is supposed to be sustainable consumption in schools, I think this program would be actually very, very good, where parents actually take the lead in feeding our children. Uh, promote consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables also comes in. We should not only produce them, but we should consume them. If you look at the uh, areas you know, around Kampala where food, uh, these fresh fruits and, and vegetables come from, you know, they are just grown specifically for the market. They just grow nakati, deliver to the market without consuming it at home. So I think there's need for those campaigns 
uh, people to know uh, that actually consumption is very, very important. Empower consumers to make informed choices uh, in the consumption of healthy diets. This one was discussed this morning, uh, you know, about the sodas, the what, you know, uh, the kind of diets that we are actually consuming. I think the consumers need to be empowered uh, by information, etc. And then there's need to promote adoption and uptake of improved post-service technologies that mitigate losses. If we have food losses, huh? definitely the availability of food will not be you know, are sustainable. And then, of course, food waste also. There are people who are wasting food. I'm sure uh, this afternoon, uh, when we are having our lunch, many of you left food on your place. Why did you put it there anyway? So, well, okay. To boost nature positive production, um, it is imp very, very important that the, uh, you know, our biodiversity is maintained, which we are proud of. And uh, well, one way is to promote climate smart, smart agriculture. This country is, the, you know, is having a very big project on this, uh, you know, climate smart agriculture. But uh, is it, uh, you know, addressing all the challenges that our farmers are facing? Is, is it every way? I think there's need for, you know, scaling it up. And then uh, when it comes to genetic resources, in here we are recommending mainly, you know, emphasis on our indigenous seed. Our indigenous crops are disappearing, and yet they used to be very, very good in terms of nutrients and also in terms of, you know, being resilient uh, to effects of climate change. We need to protect, manage, and restore water resources and catchment areas. You know, uh, one of the biggest challenges of irrigation systems is that, the, you know, people fail to get, the, you know, good sources of water because we don't have, you know, um, very good water resources and catchment areas. So I think this is important. Then we need to scale up our community-based, you know, uh, reforestation, planting trees, greening Uganda, very, very important. And I think this, uh, this campaign is almost all over, everywhere, at least to plant a tree each day so that we can now, uh, you know, return the trees which are very, very important in terms of managing the greenhouse emissions. Promote regenerative agriculture. So by regenerative agriculture, I, I mean agriculture that helps the soils, you know, the, the ecosystem to rejuvenate, and then you have, you know, sustainable, you know, uh, production. So this is very, very important uh, for us to do. And there are definitely the, the legal aspects of it, the policies which need to be improved, and then what should be done in terms of human, you know, being the, especially the extension, you know, our, our workers. Okay. Um, second last is the advance to equitable livelihoods. We need to um, expand you know, the scope and coverage of care, support, and social protection for all categories of people. Nobody should actually be left behind, especially the vulnerables, you know, like the children, uh, the, the sick, the elderly, you know, and the marginalized people. I think all this actually needs to be, uh, you know, done. And the, I'm sure the Minister of Gender knows very well what I'm um, actually talking about. But we need to promote women's economic empowerment, uh, leadership, and ownership of agricultural resources. You know, do they actually own land? What are they owning? Produce and go? Yeah, you know, so all those policies which are in there have to be looked into, and, uh, and then they require the money. Uh, we need to um, enhance community mobilization and mindset change for the sustainable agriculture development. The mindset change actually is very, very important. Uh, people are aware of the need for sustainable agriculture development. They're just doing anything that they, they want. Then promote national insurance schemes in health, agriculture, and education. Very, very important. The insurance is very, very important. And should there be uh, actually uh, challenges, you know, in agriculture, I think the insurance can come in and help our farmers, especially the smallholder farmers. And then we need to increase uh, smallholder access to agriculture, agriculture, credit and financing, you know, because they need the money, to continue as, you know, access to, to money in order for them to continue producing very well. Action plan number five is about building resiliency to vulnerabilities, you know, sh shocks and stresses. And in here, we are talking about increasing production of climate change yet crop varieties, especially our indigenous varieties. So the recommendations in there um, um, come, uh, you know, along the issues of what should NARO do 
what should be the uh, uh, the zonal, you know, uh, the zonal agricultural, uh, you know, uh, production and the research areas do. And then, of course, the emphasis, as I said, being put on our indigenous, you know, varieties, both actually uh, crops and the animals. There is a need first to have establishment of national food reserves and buffer stocks. So we don't have, you know, national reserves here. And I think this should go even up to district level, at least regional levels, where we can keep food. That should there be uh, a shock or a stress, food can easily be accessed, and then people don't actually suffer. You know, right now we are depending on WFP and the other relief agencies to help us. Um, we need to decentralize, um, you know, disaster, emergency response, and early warning systems. In here, there are so many activities that we recommended, including, including your post-feminism, which are very, very important. You know, that, that at the district level, people cannot tell. They don't have any early warning systems, you know, to tell that the, some of these disasters are actually coming. And then, of course, we need to provide incentives to farmers, you know, especially those who are, who are in, in groups and cooperatives, so that they can actually mitigate the effects of these shocks and stressors. So we feel that out of the so many, you know, recommendations, out of the so many game changers, these are actually very, very important. You know, if at least this could be included in the um, NDP4, they could actually help us to at least to some extent address the issues of the commitments that we actually done. So in conclusion, I believe that the um, food systems transformation provides a definitely important foundation for accelerating sustainable uh, you know, development in this country. And the you know, um, capabilities have not been uh, properly harnessed to deliver sustainable food systems you know, uh, nutritional outcomes. Very, very important indeed. And going forward, we need to, you know, to stop joking. The biz business as usual should, should actually stop. And then uh, definitely these game changers should be incorporated within the uh, NDP4 uh, programs, provide the, you know, uh, opportunities, new opportunities uh, to strategically position the food systems approach in the national development agenda. Uh, thank you very much. I thank very much uh, FAO. Uh, for uh, funding this uh, activity and the Office of the Prime Minister for and other coordinators for the uh, proper coordination. Thank you very much. Let's again thank uh, Professor Achileo Kaya for the presentation. Uh, I learned one word one phrase that I will be using, if it's not safe, it's not good. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Tugume Job. He's going to talk about passive pest surveillance, expert working groups, and digital tools, the future of pest surveillance in Uganda. Dr. Job. Okay. Is uh, Secretariat, is his presentation ready? Okay, it is ready. So we sit. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ajoa Batugume. I'm a senior agriculture inspector from MAIF. Uh, I'm happy to be talking about this uh, uh, important subject of food security and nutrition. Uh, please uh, scroll. Um, my presentation, I uh, will be talking about the uh, background pests and diseases of crops in, and food security. Uh, national pest surveillance and emergency response framework, passive surveillance and expert working groups, success stories of pest surveillance and responses, key actionable recommendations and, re and conclusions. Um, colleagues, um, 
we have about four uh, dimensions of food security. Uh, we have uh, the availability, access, and utilization. Uh, but below them, uh, we have the safety dimension. Um, pests and diseases have capacity to, di to disrupt all the dimensions of food security. Um, and this reminds me some time back uh, when a preacher made his presentation and he was like, what you think is very important to you, it can disappear overnight. So pests and diseases have capacity uh, to disrupt our food systems and actually cause food insecurity and nutritional security. Next. Um, allow me give you a few highlights um, of the pests that have entered Uganda and had impact. Uh, almost there is no crop that has not been spared. All of us remember banana bacterial wilt in 2001, um, coffee wilt also 2001, and, and many others as projected. You would note these have affected uh, incomes, they have affected uh, food security. Definitely, sometimes if you don't have income, you can also not access food. So, uh, next. Next. So, um, there are much more, more, uh, Pests and diseases, some are affecting our aquaculture, aquaculture systems, uh, others are affecting our regions. Uh, for example, we have a weed called Parthenium, which most of you will move around and see it on the roads, but has, uh, has capacity to disrupt um, the beef and dairy industry uh, by reducing the pastures. Next. Uh, economics tend to talk about a basket of, of goods, and most of us, when we go to uh, the market, these are some of the food items we tend to uh, collect. But look on the side, pests and diseases are having effects on these ones. Tomatoes, cassava. Uh, we have even a new disease of bananas that is in Congo, but has recently entered uh, Uganda, Suruka, Sese, and West Nairo districts. That has capacity uh, to dismate banana production in Uganda. Uh, most of you now know that, for example, sometime back, we used to go to the market and come with a basket of tomatoes. But recently, one tomato is almost costing 1,000 shillings. That is because uh, we have new pests like tuta absoluta that are actually disrupting uh, tomato production. Most of you have bought mangoes in the market. We have issues of fruit fries um, where you buy the mangoes and you, you can't eat them. Just this is just a small snapshot of how pests and diseases are affecting uh, our food systems, uh, but sometimes they are often neglected when we are talking about issues of food and nutritional security. Uh, we have much more pests also on the horizon, like tropical race for Zairela fastidiosa, to mention but a few. Uh, what is the strategic position of the Department of Crop Protection where I come from? Uh, the Department of Crop Inspection and Certification touches two main areas, it touches production and also the other part of marketing, market access. Uh, we are meant to safeguard our agricultural production from external pests and diseases because of their effects. Uh, also, these pests affect market access, and therefore, 
our produce they end up not accessing the markets. Example is uh, a pest called uh, forest called Doring Mo that has disrupted our markets uh, in Europe. What that means is that a farmer depending on that product, that crop uh, for income, um, his income is reduced. We all know that we don't produce what we, have, we, we eat. That means some of it we have to access through the market. So uh, re reduction in income has a direct impact uh, also you know, on our nutritional security. Next. Uh, so uh, how are we looking at safeguarding our crops? Uh, as a ministry, as a department, we have come up with a national pest surveillance and notification and emergency response framework and plan. And in this, we are aiming at strengthening coordination of plant pest surveillance activities and reporting by taking advantage of diversified communication channels and modern IT tools. We also aim to strengthen human resource capacity to conduct surveillance through collaboration with other departments of government, narrow academia, and private sector through what we call uh, expert working groups. Uh, we have a lot of experts in the country, but in most cases, each one of us have been working in isolation and information arising from our research uh, is, no, is often not shared, um, which complicates pest management. Uh, also, hope to strengthen systems for emergency pest response by leveraging on partners, advocating for creation of a special fund for pest surveillance and response. Most often, when a new pest attacks, it should also be considered as an emergency, but most often as a department, we often don't have resources to respond promptly. Allow me to talk about passive surveillance and expert working groups and digital tools. Um, experts, um, Really, it is me and you, drawn from academia, the different people who are working on these issues of pests and diseases. Uh, when I talk about passive surveillance, uh, I'm trying to mean uh, surveillance that is not official. Each one of us somehow interacts with crops and sees strange things, pests and diseases, but often you don't report. But uh, those are the major sources of information on new pests and diseases. So when we talk about strength and pest surveillance, passive surveillance, we are looking at tapping at all possibilities that any of communities helping in reporting pests and diseases. So passive surveillance involves community surveillance. We also have plant clinics, uh, pest reports from researchers, to reports from extension of workers and media. Uh, as far as official surveillance, we normally do specific surveys, monitoring surveys, and delimiting surveys. When we talk, we talk about official surveillance, it means it is the ministry and specifically the Department of Crop Inspection and Certification which is the National Plant Protection Organization that is doing surveillance. But we are lean, so we have to rely on other stakeholders to make sure that we promptly report pests. So once all the information comes in, experts should be able to validate it and report the pests promptly. What is the work of the expert working groups? to develop survey plans and participate in pest survey and report mapping, analyze pests and compile reports, uh, validating the reports, and supporting pest risk analysis, uh, developing survey manuals and diagnostics, supporting development of pest eradication and 
strategies for priority pests and mobilizing resources. You, um, we don't need to wait uh, for pests to come. Pests should find us when we are prepared. Uh, so the work of the expert working groups should be reported through National Technical Working Group on preparedness and early response and coordination. That's where um, the Office of the Prime Minister would also be helpful if pests and diseases are considered disasters. Next. Uh, allow me to talk about a few success stories of, of, of where we have worked together and we are seeing progress. Uh, I talked about the media. Media is also important in reporting pests and diseases, uh, such that all stakeholders start doing action. Next. Next. So uh, in 20. 2013, a new pesto of maize was reported called maize lethal necrosis. But we've been working with the uh, different stakeholders to monitor the incidences in the field. As you can note, in 2016, we had the incidences of 27%. In 2018, we had 7.5%. In 2019, it was reduced, and now, through the efforts of different stakeholders, uh, in 2013, um, it is at 12.5%. Uh, but what was key is that when this disease came, the stakeholders came up together, the experts came together and came up with a strategy for managing uh, the disease. Uh, we have a new disease, uh, banana bunch top virus, and there what I'm showing is the risk. Uh, green is the major banana growing area. Uh, the orange is where banana is less grown. But you note that the disease is confirmed in Kasese and is now a major risk to major banana growing areas through uh, Expert working groups, we came together, did what we call a limiting survey, and still found that the disease is still confined uh, in West Nile and Kasese districts. Next. Um, through our work of pest surveillance, we have found that uh, pests and diseases do not know borders, but also the border communities are imaginary. They are always exchanging planting materials, which increases the risk uh, of spread and introduction of new diseases. Also, we note that civil wars, the wars uh, in Congo, also contribute because, um, uh, because when people are being displaced, they tend to go along with their animals, plants, and some of those plants uh, can be sick. So, OPM in your preparedness, refugees, uh, involve uh, MAIF. Um, again, community sensitization and awareness is key uh, when we are looking at tackling new, new pests and diseases. Next. Um, again, no one should be left behind when it comes to pests. Um, Best reporting, that's uh, why they, we are talking about the emphasis of passive surveillance. Uh, through our work, we found that secondary school children can be very, even primary, they are very keen, they know what is going on in their community, and they are very instrumental in best reporting. Next. Uh, actionable recommendations. We need collaboration and partnership in pest surveillance and response to pest incursions and the involvement of the community and other partners is important to achieve leverage. Uh, we need proper coordination of pest surveillance and response efforts. We need a crop pests and disease desk if possible at OPM. I'm not aware if it, it is there. 
it was there, I think I should know. Uh, we need a national PESAR information system um, where information on pests and diseases uh, can be uh, received. We are working with partners like Plant Village to set up what we call uh, a pest monitoring uh, through computers. We are calling it a pest observatory. Uh, at the, it will be based at the, our quarantine facility in Namarere. Uh, we need a national emergency response and pest eradication programs. We have pest eradication programs in Ministry of Health. Uh, we have pest uh, vaccination programs in ANMO, but we have not had a pest uh, eradication program in the Ministry of Agriculture. Next. Yeah, I thank all our collaborators who have allowed us to, to do this work. Thank you very much. Uh, let's again uh, thank Dr. Mugume for the presentation. Well done. I have learned that the best have no boundaries. We can get them anytime. And I've also learned that as we chase them away or we survey, we should leave no one behind. All of us must participate. We are left with one presenter to complete this session unless, uh, unless, um, unless Mr. Brian Hogan Ross appears. He's not here. So now let me invite uh, our last presenter, Mrs. Julia Amara. She's going to talk about contributions of water and environment to nutrition and food security in Uganda. Most welcome. Let us welcome Mrs. Julia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I am happy to be here and I'm happy to see all of you, especially the people from the local governments, because I'm proud a Ugandan who has worked in all the local governments. If I've not been to your local government, I've been to your mother local government. So I'm called the 12 as the Julia Bidiet. I work with the Ministry of Water and Environment. The background is sociology, but I'm a focal point officer for nutrition. Uh, they have told you what I'm going to say, but ideally the vision of our ministry is sound management and sustainable utilization of water and environment resource for the betterment of the populations of Uganda. Uh, we have our mission uh, to promote and ensure the rational and sustainable utilization, development and effective management of water and environment resource for social economic development of this country. Under the UNAP 2, uh, maybe I will give you a background that towards the corona there, that's when the ministry was invited to start working on UNAP and nutrition. And so uh, when we joined, we went to Corona, we had only had one meeting as a ministry that you have to start ministering, and then we went for Corona. So from there to date, we are really busy working. So uh, MWE is expected to provide quality assurance, increase access to nutrition sensitive water, sanitation and hygiene, and water for food system services at all levels. Next. Uh, I will uh, I will go straight to the uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I I will go. Let me use this. I will go straight to the, the that goal for UNAP. Everybody has talked about the goal for UNAP, so I think I should not go to that goal. I should go straight to the objectives of our ministry, uh, which are aligned with the NDP3, 
underlined with the UNAP is to increase access and utilization of nutrition sensitive water for agriculture production services. As you are told, Minister of Agriculture is doing some work on water for production, and Minister of Water is doing some work on water for production. So the second one is to increase access to, to and utilization of nutrition sensitive wash services. And then we have to strengthen the enabling environment. Next. Um, under food systems, uh, Professor Kaya has talked of food systems and participated in the summit. And this summit for us, we are track number three, boosting nature positive production. And under that goal, the ministry is to boost the nature positive production system at all scale to globally meet the fundamental human rights to health and nutrition food, nutritious food, while operating within the parameters of the boundaries. And the, under that, we are, support, we are supposed to protect, manage, sustainably manage, and restore or rehabilitate. Under protection, yes, we are protecting the environment, we are managing it, and we are restoring, as you would be seeing. So now, what are our contributions? Our ministry mainly has engineers. So explaining to them our contribution is equally explaining to everybody how does water contribute, how do we, what do we do to contribute to the environment, or what are our mandate to contribute to environment. One time I had a presentation, this presentation to people from Nigeria, an old man came and said, when this lady stood up to talk, I was like, what is she talking about? Because he's an engineer. But eventually, after realizing he had, he saw that we had a lot of things to contribute as the ministry to nutrition. One, of course, safe and clean water is essential for all the body system processes. Uh, we say water is life, and of course, water being life, uh, we all need that life. I can see we have a lot of water in front of us, and I would request, as I talk, you take a sip and you enjoy that life. So water is the most nutritious food. It is the most nutritious food in this world. You can eat anything, you can eat greens, but water is the most nutritious food. Uh, promote agroforestry. We do, we have a department in charge of uh, agroforestry, forestry, so we provide those fruits uh, when we are giving you seedlings, we give you seedlings of both the trees and the ones for fruits. And those fruits have various vitamins, they have essential oils that are needed in your human body. You need those fruits for that oil. Uh, for, for the ladies, normally they tell you to eat avocado so that your skin is nice. The, the trees also uh, bring it back, bring it back. The trees also support rain. Here I was on food, here I'm on, on climate change. They support the rain, they hold the, 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 the soils, and they are for fuel. If a woman has fuel, they will cook for their children. They are improving their nutrition. Uh, we have also water for irrigation, and this water for irrigation directly boosts nature also and boost directly contributes to nutrition. Uh, someone here talked of um, people going to the wetland, but they go to the wetland to look for water. But if we had irrigation systems on mainland, maybe they wouldn't go to the wetlands. They would just have their agricultural uh, products on the land, not in the wetland. Next. Uh, water for production also promotes growth of pasture that is essential for animals. Our animals need pasture, and that water for production does that. The healthy animals provide protein vital for humans. Uh, we have hand washing, we also do hand washing. Uh, this hand washing allows the body to remain healthy, allows the body to utilize the food substance available to eat. 
If you wash your hands, you don't have germs, definitely the food will be utilized very well. We do also protecting lakes and, uh, and wetlands. And you all know that uh, if we protect catchment areas, we shall not have floods. But also, we have the marine protein. Everyone here, uh, uh, people, most people enjoy the fish, catfish, mudfish, whichever type of fish. So once we protect, we find them there. Next. Yeah, we provide sanitary facilities, and these sanitary facilities normally we construct when we work in a town. Uh, for example, Butareja, we work in that town, we provide uh, lined pit or um, waterborne, and this waterborne can be in institutions or in schools. This is a shared responsibility between the Minister of Water and the Environment, Minister of Education, and Minister of Health. It is a shared responsibility. So we, we promote good sanitation and hygiene. We produce exposure of fecal matter to water and food. Uh, we have created a department called Sewage Services Department. And this department, we are doing a lot in terms of uh, constructing, first of all, the sites where to dump, we give the fecal sludge trucks, and also we make sure that we sensitize people about that. Because ideally, we would go to a small town, and when you go to a small town, you put a water supply system, immediately people would start constructing uh, septic tanks. But eventually, where would they take? They don't know. So that's when we started doing that activity and ensuring that at least we sensitize them and tell them where to go. And the challenge we had there is that most of the people had pit latrines. And when you bring this truck, they would collapse. So we have now work of sensitizing our people to have lined, lined pits or septic tanks. Uh, we have all those messages that we move around with sanitation marketing uh, and uh, at least we have officers in every region who are doing that. Uh, we have water quality monitoring. We do water quality monitoring. And this water quality monitoring will ensure that quality clean and safe water is given to you at all times for our bodies. And also the reason why we do that, when you have clean quality water, you monitor and this quality, your body will do what will you drink good water and you have a good digestion. We do also women empowerment. We empower women with the charcoal serving stoves. We teach them how to do that. We also teach them to make stoves. And ideally, a woman that has some little money, it is a matter of telling her, buy an egg for your child. But the money will be there after empowering. Next. Uh, water quality monitoring, I think I've repeated that. Next. Yes. I told you we restore, we sustainably manage, and here it is what we do, restoring. You can see up, we are restoring. Down, we are giving out seedlings. The other side, we are also promoting that type of bamboo. You know bamboo is both for climate, catching the soil, but also you can eat it. You can eat bamboo shoots the people in, in Bali can enjoy. But also we have realized that the youngest bamboo, when you chop it, when it is still young, still you can get good food there. Next. Here we are protecting the wetland. Sometimes people want to go beyond that mark, but that mark means don't go beyond. 20 meters out of the lake, don't go. The other side there, we are protecting. In, in Kabare, we used to have a lot of terraces, but uh, as I talk now, they are a little bit few, and uh, as you can see here, we are again telling them that you need those terraces back. Then the other side is gabion protection. You are also protecting the soils, not to just run away downstream. Yes, now we go to what, you know, this is Dokoro. This is Dokoro water supply system. We commissioned it and people now are enjoying safe and clean water. 
The other side is uh, the truck we are giving out for fico sludge. Then down is irrigation. We are doing small scale and medium irrigation. Next. Here we are empowering the women with support from uh, ADB, African Development Bank. We are supporting those women and we are teaching them. A woman who knows that they really the charcoal stoves takes little, little charcoal, quickly they will cook for their children. They will use little charcoal, but they cook for their children. There you have empowered them with the money, they can buy an egg for their children. Next. This picture shows how technology can support producing more from less. We are not destroying the environment. You are getting a lot, but from less land. Come again. next. Now, the challenges. We can't be there without challenges. The first challenge is land degradation. The next challenge is high levels of urbanization. Everyone wants to come to urban. Then we have influx of refugees. They also impact on our land. We have to give them land because they are here with us. They are not going anywhere. Uh, we have climate change as an effect of all that. We have land tenure system where you find the people in wetland and someone tells you, I have a title. So what do you do? Next. So increase demand for wood and other forest products like charcoal, timber production, timber production, and then wood has also become a serious challenge. You have seen on TV, some people being chased from Guru, they were destroying the environment, the trees, they were cutting down the trees. Uh, we have uh, conversion of forests into public land. People are turning forests into, into agricultural land, into factories. Into, into, into grazing, and when they are grazing, they first cut the trees. Uh, we have high electricity tariffs, which makes forests a cheaper source of wood for domestic and industrial use. Yes, yeah, someone has clapped, thank you. Uh, we have uh, population pressure, that one you all know. Uh, inadequate funding for eviction. Do you know it is not easy to evict someone? If someone has stayed there for over five years, you have to pay them. So the money is not enough to evict people. Because if you evict them, you pay them. Then we have limited personnel to manage the different natural resources. These natural resources where they are, we have environmental police, but this environmental police is not everywhere. Uh, if I ask someone in Kabale, do you know where the environmental police is? They don't know. If you ask someone where, but we have them, but they are limited. Then we have expensive technologies to ensure universal coverage of water supply. The technologies are very expensive. For example, personally, if you asked me that water which runs from Karamoja and goes to Tesoran and, and destroys all those crops, if we had like a mega dam crossing from Kaperabion down to Napa, one, it would help to the cattle restaurants would not cross, two, they would have water for their cows, three, they would have a purpose. It would be a multi-purpose. You put their fish, they have food. So if I had money, I, 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 and the chairman is looking at me, it would be a mega one, which is like a real lake, from Kapera Biongo down to... So conflict management, you finished it, you have finished food, you have protected the people, everything would be incorporated in that nutrition-sensitive dam. Uh, we have... Um, uh, Depleted and aging infrastructure. Our infrastructure is aging every day. And it needs the money. It needs the money, which money is limited. Next. Uh -huh. We have planned activities. We are not sleeping. We are not sleeping with this nutrition. We are, we are planning activities. Uh, we developed, as a ministry, we developed a, ministry, a nutrition ministry strategy. It was launched during uh, the water week of March, uh, and uh, with the support from UNICEF, 
uh, we are planning to go ahead and disseminate at regional levels. Uh, I don't know whether Madam Nelly is here. Madam President of Nutrition, please stand up and you deserve a hand clap. She's the president of nutrition in Uganda and she has supported me. No wonder they chose her to be the president. Uh, we are trying to appoint uh, desk officers at regional level because most of our offices, we have the headquarters in Ruzira, but also at regional level, we have the, 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 the concentrated, we have offices, so we are planning to have desk officers for nutrition who would be feeding me and then I feed the OPM with information and, and, and work. Then we have also appointed, you have rushed several, <laughs> You have, we have also appointed the key staff to, to plan specifically for nutrition. We need, we need it to be incorporated in water, not construction, not, 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 not gender, not streaming, not HIV, but also nutrition. Uh, we have included the nutrition program in the community engagement. We are developing a community engagement which is underway. We have to make sure that it has nutrition as part of it. Next. And next, uh, huh? uh, not that one. We are developing, as I talk now, we have a strategy, but we are developing a training manual so that we can go and train the people on ground with the steel support from UNICEF. We are planning to start awareness campaigns at departmental level. So if I have an appointment for the registration department, uh, we are planning to have a breastfeeding corner this one, this one, thank you ladies for clapping. This was a gift from our PS during the Women's Day of last year. So we, that, that nutrition, that corner for breastfeeding adjacent, we are going also to construct a gym. We also still have people with the, with the best, with, with, who are our best in the ministry, so we are going to have the gym also. <laughs> now, this one is very serious. We are planning to have environmental court. During this water week, we invited the, uh, the, the chief judge, and he promised us to have environmental court. You do anything on environment, you have a specific court for you to judge you properly. Next. Now, opportunities. We have opportunities. We have the legal and policy framework in place. We have developed the strategy which will guide us. We have a multi-sector approach uh, led by the OPM. We have the political will because my, 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 my minister, my Minister Honorable Samu Cheptoris has already appended a signature on the strategy, meaning that he supports me. My other, uh, line, other ministries, ministers, state ministers, Mama Mabira is already there with me, and Madam Aisha Sechin, they are all supporting me, seriously. Then the main strategy, for those who would want to see more about that strategy I'm talking about, you can Google www.mwe.go.ug, you will find there the strategy. Next. Next. Now, all of these uh, are, are the materials I developed with the support from, from UNICEF that I used during the launch, but uh, the people have supported me, as you can see, OPM, uh, I think I forgot my if. Please write my if there. <laughs> yes, yes, please add my if. Uh, uh, UNICEF, NPA, Mr. Bugenje, where are you? We can also clap for Bugenje. He gave me a, a serious support. Uh, we have Minister of Health, Madam Samari. I saw her here. Claps for Madam Samari. <laughs> Uh, Minister of Local Government. Local Government, uh, let me see, where is Sam Gariwang? But I have support from Local Government here in Kampara and specific. Then we have a Minister of Gender and Social Development. He's here, Everest. Can we clap for Everest? 
We have Minister of Education. Where is Amos? He has gone. We have KCCA and others. If I have forgotten you, please just forgive me. You know that I was excited. So before I, I conclude, before I conclude, I want to leave you with a quote. And that quote is from Julia Child. But that Julia Child is not me. It's a writer and a food scientist in America. She said, water is the most neglected nutrient in your diet, but one of the most vital. You neglect that water, but it's the most vital. Can we take uh, some water, more water, please? Let us take more water. Let us take more water. So I thank you so, so much for listening. And uh, I request all of you, I know the local governments, we shall be coming to your districts. I will be available. We shall be available. Please support us. We still need this support because we are young in the nutrition and food systems. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. I was planning to give you, to ask you to do an energizer, but she has done it. We don't need another one. Thank you so much. Let's clap for her again. Julia, thank you so much. Now, this quote is from Julia, this one, not from the other author. This one says, safe and clean water is the most nutritious food. That is your quote. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now I beg for your indulgence. I need only 25 minutes. And I'm going to use these 25 minutes as follows. I would like to invite Mr. Grace Buenje, who is going to moderate the panel the panel session. Is Mr. Grace Buenji around? Yes, please come forward. And then I would like to invite the following again. Some of you are going to be repeated. Professor Charles Muyanja, please come forward. Professor Achille Okaya. Uh, Mrs. Margaret Athieno Muevesa. Dr. Barbara Zawede and Mr. Mutiaba Godfrey. I see only three, where are the others? Anyone missing? Of Professor Charles Mutiaba. Professor Mtiapa Wadi? Yes, he's around. Okay, good. Tenua Emmanuel is representing uh, Mrs. Margaret Muevesa. I think we have a full house. So I would like to invite Mr. Buenje to come and moderate this question this session, of course, by firing them questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as introduced, I'm called Grace Buenje, and I work. Uh, he's telling me I have a very short time here. I'm called Grace Buenje. I plan for agriculture at the National Planning Authority. Uh, my panelists, I don't have so much time, as you have known. And I will begin uh, with uh, Dr. Barbara Zawede. Uh, you work for NARO and in the National Development Plan Theory. Uh, we identified that we want to upscale uh, biofortification and also to uh, increase the multiplication of these technologies that were actually were on your 
shelves, beans, uh, cassava, and all of that. And then so uh, what have you done to, to ensure that? You just have like two minutes? Okay, three. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. As narrow, most of what we have done has actually been shared by our line ministry, but I will emphasize what we have done. One is to develop biofortified products of beans, maize, sweet potato, millet, bananas, and uh, I invite you to visit our stall downstairs and you have a look at what we have done so that you learn more on what we are doing since I have a very short time. But we have also used modern biosciences to make sure that we manage some of the pests and diseases and other emerging issues that are affecting our agriculture in this country. We are using new breeding techniques to make sure that whatever we can't solve using our conventional methods, we use the modern breeding techniques to solve them. And some of the pests that were mentioned from the phytosanitary department are what we are actually using modern biosciences to address. I don't want to forget the fact that because of climate change, we are now going back to some of our foods that we had forgotten to support food diversity. So we are working with indigenous vegetables. We are working with local chicken. Today, someone was asking me what is the difference between indigenous and uh, locally adapted. So we shall use the word locally adapted because sometimes these are introduced, but because they've stayed here for long, we go to calling them indigenous. But we have our local chicken, which we know, first of all, because we manage it in a semi-intensive or free range, we do not use a lot of the modern or synthetic concentrates. And as a result, we get more of them consuming the grains, consuming the nutrition that are in our soils, and they take longer, but they are more nutritious than some of the exotics we are consuming. We have the diary cattle that was mentioned by our line ministry. We have the goats. We have brought in some of the breeds that we know are climate resilient. For example, the Kalahari goat to promote it here and to improve our breeds by crossing them with this goat bread. We have the fish proteins, for example, the Nile patch, the Nile tilapia, which we know is a domestic fish in our Lake Victoria. We have the Angara and the pelagic fish like Mokene, Nang Nang. We are not only multiplying them, but also making sure that we add value to them so that they can reach our people and they consume it and they get the nutrients. Okay. And we are not stopping on that, mm. but we are also supporting industry. We are supporting industry by doing nutrient profiling to know whatever product we are producing, like the avocado oil, like the fish oil, we actually profile the nutrients to understand what is in there. And we are pro pro producing prototypes for them so that they can then take them and use them. Again, when you visit our stall, you're going to see wine from purple fleshed sweet potato. You're going to see beer that is produced from cassava that has been developed by Naro. So there are a lot of opportunities, not only in the food industry, but also in the, in the, in the industry for manufacturing. Thank you. I want to summarize Thank you. by acknowledging some of our partners. I want to acknowledge USID Feed the Future Project, which has supported us to do this work, the EU Dino Project, Poika Veggie Seed Project, and Jaika Pride Rice that have greatly supported us to do the biofortification and value addition work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can I clap for her? Please go ahead.
Very good, Professor Kaya of Makerere. Uh, you realize that all she's talking about uh, is being affected or can be affected by uh, food safety challenges. Uh, and I know you are the lead consultant on uh, the strategic analysis that was conducted for food systems transformation in Uganda. And I saw your game changer matrix and the biggest responses went to having food safety challenges uh, in, the, in, in the country. So uh, how is this limiting our competitiveness uh, as a country? And uh, someone talked about us. Uh, you are the one, you give a challenge that we should incorporate actually these interventions in the coming plan, the NDP4. So what, what should we write in the plan? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Grace Bwenje, the moderator. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Uh, you know, the issue of food safety is a serious one, because as I said, if it is not safe, it is, uh, it is not food. And we are not here to actually poison the population, but we want them to eat good food. And the, the foodborne illnesses, you know, can be over 200 that have been actually reported ranging from diarrhea to uh, cancers, as the, for example, recently reported about uh, aflatoxins causing liver cancer, serious liver cancer. Uh, these, uh, some of these uh, you know, uh, compounds, especially the chemicals, can uh, you know, uh, bind the important nutrients in the body, making them unavailable. And of course, even during you know, uh, sickness, when somebody's metabolism is not uh, working properly, it means that some of the nutrients will not be available for the body to utilize. So uh, the, bearing in mind, therefore, that the, we have got handlers, good handlers, as the, uh, uh, Dr. Kundo was talking about this morning, you know, who have messed up the food. People's more, you know, a degradation is a serious problem in this country. People are using all sorts of materials to add to the food. You know, formalin, um, uh, transformer oil, uh, you know, uh, adding cassava to milk, EPC. So you wonder whether actually people have brains or not. I think we need now to work on, uh, on that, first of all, to make sure that our people understand that what they are doing is actually wrong. Awareness, you know, the consumer awareness is very, very important, you know, of what they are supposed to eat. Um, uh, this uh, afternoon, uh, people ate, for example, granuts from that Luwombo. You know, and did you know what the granuts contained? We trusted the we trust the system, not so. Yeah, but you never know, because if you go to the areas where they process those granuts, which are both processed, you know, the granite flour, the 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 the, the pests and whatever. You actually wonder whether we, you know, how we actually survive sometimes, you know. So the, the inspection is completely gone. You know, people are doing their own, whatever that they want. You know, the, the food control, the, you know, system in place is completely broken down. So we have got very good policies, we have got very good laws, we have got very good standards. Actually, over 1,400 food standards from UNBS. But who is aware of those standards? Who is actually practicing them? Very few, especially the private sector, maybe. You know, so I think we need to see uh, the food actually, you know, system working. We need to see simple approach technologies being available to our farmers, because some of the actually most of the contamination starts from the farm, uh, because they uh, they are drying produce on bare ground. That means that they don't have a means of you know drying off the ground drying faster, you know, if there could be uh, simple technologies of the, you know, improvised dryers, including soil dryers, which are actually, you know, affordable. I think the cleanliness of the food would actually be, you know, um, uh, established. Now, the hygiene and sanitation, which is a very good preventive measure. Cleanliness, are people washing their hands before they touch the food? These street, you know, uh, street food vendors, what is their level of cleanliness? You know, how are they handling the food? Are they clean, are they sorting? Are they separating? Are they cooling the food in case it requires the cold, you know, chain storage? 
I was informed that the people who say the, or offers behind that, they normally put it uh, on top of uh, the roof at night and then take it you know, down mm -hmm. you know, in the morning and continue selling. So is that the system that we want? I think we need to go beyond this and this should actually be practical. We need to come out and talk about these things which are actually happening rather than just keeping quiet. So I think that is very, very important. Training is key. Can we have at least a training like a, uh, how uh, Dr. Kundo was talking about of these you know, food handlers, so that they know that what they are doing is actually not appropriate. So I think that those are some of the uh, issues. But then also um, um, the containers which we use for, for example, processing our food. Uh, look at those who are processing, milling granites, those are milling uh, maize flour. You know, if you heard about the, the Nakanyonyi case, where over 200 pupils were poisoned by food, you know, the, the, it was actually the maize flour. It contained the, the metallic particles, which are got from those, you know, uh, uh, the, the mirrors, the hammer mirrors, which were on the tear. So it poisoned over 200, uh, you know, pupils. We are lucky that actually they didn't die. So I think all those should actually be looked into. Can't we actually now, you know, uh, provide those equipment at subsidized, you know, uh, prices so they can be uh, actually achieved? So those are some of the issues that I, I think would be actually handled, and even many more. That's why I decided, I, I put, um, you know, uh, uh, the, one of the most important game changers as, you know, addressing the issues of food safety, you know, uh, in the within the uh, action tracker number one. Thank you very much, Prof. You can clap for him. Please go ahead. I, I was fearing to stop you uh, because you, you taught me in class and you continue to teach me. Uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Muyanja of Makere, uh, Eunice uh, in highlighted uh, in their next activities for UNAP. Uh, they plan to put in place uh, post-harvest handling equipment. Uh, and then also, uh, Professor Kaya highlighted in action track two uh, under sustainable consumption uh, that we should manage uh, food, food waste. But, but what we don't know uh, this animal in the room, uh, how, much, how much is there in terms of food loss and waste? and what could be the mitigation uh, measures. Uh, my name is the Charles Muyanja from Akere. Uh, people usually call me Professor Muyanja, but I don't usually do that. Uh, Sometimes when I'm talking to people who are not professors, I don't say it, but when the professor is there, I say it. <laughs> Why I don't do that? I don't want to be made thinking. Because sometimes people think that professors don't know everything, but sometimes some don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, that's a challenge. That's why I say my name is Mianja Charles, so that I can get a lot of information from other people, and then I become a full professor. Yes. So thank you very much for the question. Uh, actually, the area is talking about is so wide. You cannot do it within even 10 minutes. But just to tell you, uh, there's enough food for everybody in the world. But that case is not like that. I'll give you a scenario here in Uganda. You have a lot of matok in the Western Uganda, but people in Kalamoja die. Why is it like that? Is it a food insecurity? Or is food lack of food distribution? Which is which? Sometimes we know the answer. But again, when it comes to the real food we produce, for example, you have a small farm, you plant and grow maize there, and you expect maybe eight tannies, but at the end of the day, you can get the eight tannies, but when you reach the market, you find you have six tannies. You ask yourself, where did the two go? 
Sometimes you may not know where it has gone. Maybe it has been stolen, which is unlikely, but possible. And maybe also, during the transportation, maybe your truck goes down, some bugs they spill over. But to make the quality has been what? lost. You can't pick them. That when you leave. Maybe during the storage, some is eaten by the pests. That one you sort and throw it away. So there are many challenges when you look at the food supply system that uh, we have food loss and food waste. Okay, it may be concurrently, but we don't know. But when you look on the side of food loss, it occurs basically in the production system and also during the time when you're harvesting. Even when you're using your to take your material from the farm to the household, there's some kind of loss you incur, but you may not know it. And then also loss happens during the processing, manufacturing. And then maybe in the storage also, there's a lot of loss. Between those areas, and maybe when you are taking the retail matrix, there might be some losses there. So food loss covers from production up to the time we deliver to the retailer place. But when the food goes to the retail, the retail maybe supermarket, then you start entering what you call food waste. But food waste is a dangerous thing actually. And I know most of you today have done it. Yes, people leave a lot of food on the plate. That's food waste. As I tell people that when you're going to eat the food, control the eye. The eye is the one which confuses the hand to pick a lot of food. But if you can control the eye, then you can say, I'm going to eat this, then the hand will pick that. Then you don't waste food on the plate. But most of the hotels in Uganda, there's a lot of food wasted. And that food actually, when you go back how it was produced, you have used water during irrigation to produce maybe the vegetable. You have used the land itself. That's a resource. You have used maybe energy. That's a resource itself. You have used human labor. That's a resource itself. So all that is lost at the place. But you don't think about it that, ah, maybe I'm losing some hours somebody put in to produce this food. But those things happen. So food waste occurs from retail up to consumption place. At household level, I just give you simple things. At household level, you are two people, but you cook food for five people. I expect a visitor to come, suppose it doesn't come. That food is going to be wasted. So at household level, we lose a lot of food. Food is not wasted at household level. Actually, for me, I tell people at home that he, how many are we? I eat two fingers of what? My to make two. How many do you eat? Three. So they cook exactly what we eat. I don't mind the way that somebody says they soup could say. Then you're going to make more, isn't it? The same with the buffet. A buffet, you are allowed to go back and pick the food. But don't fill the plate with the food you are not going to finish. You are going to waste a lot of food. So wastage occurs at that level. So for me, is what I think about the person. The person, I look at the person is a major problem, the food. If you look at yourself, what you do to the food, you cause the losses. For example, if you don't invest in infrastructure for storage, automatically you have a lot, but you say, where am I going to keep it? Maybe you put it outside and cover it with temporary. But the lash will come and enter, the rain will come, and that food is going to what? Rust. So there are some few things we have to do in the supply chain which we can which can help us. Another thing also which I've seen in Kampala, uh, all of us we are farmers, even me I'm a farmer. The challenge you have is we produce the same stuff, isn't it? We are going to grow tomato, everybody grows tomato. At the bumper crop, everybody is taking the markets. The price goes down, the, the, the consumers are few, isn't it? So we end up losing a lot of tomato in the market. But suppose I say this area should grow tomato, another area should grow sugarcane, another area onion, and we bring the things which are not the same in the market. I think we can reduce on the losses in the market. But nobody thinks about that. But it happens a lot. So 
the logistics, the transportation system we have in Uganda is also we need to improve on it. For me, I prefer transport my material by a train. The train is better than the road, I'm telling the truth. No traffic jam, breakdown, maybe minimal. The, it, the line of a train will always be fine, isn't it? You don't find the portfolios and railway. Very rare. Yes. But now the road is here. Ah, every time the road is breaking down, the matoko right on the way. So those are some of the things. And also another thing which I always think about, uh, uh, people should try to do some kind of modeling or forecasting. How much is demand in a given area? You take exactly the amount of food in that area. Don't take excess because nobody's going to buy it. So at the end of the day, you lose. Uh, when it comes to fruits and vegetables, all of us will have vitamins, isn't it? But sometimes uh, these are perishable products. But when you look in the country, we have uh, hot temperatures, isn't it? Transport them from somewhere, uh, they pick up, uh, people are seated on it, uh, the jewel car is entering it, by the time it reaches the market, it's already spoiled, isn't it? But suppose we do some kind of refrigeration systems. Uh, I, I think about like in the milk sector, we have many collecting centers. I think this can be cooked for other sectors, whereby you have a fruit collection center, whereby farmers bring their fruits, you buy them vegetable, and then there's some kind of formal marketing. But this informal marketing is causing a lot of losses. Because yes. here you are able to control the temperatures and so on. Yes, bro. Yeah. yeah. Another thing which I want to tell you that yes. God gave us the sun, actually, innovation. In those areas where there's no electricity, you can make the sun, design a cooler room, make sure that your fruits and milk are what? Are stored there. There are so many things you can do. But this is just a touch of the subjects. Thank you very much, bro. You may clap for him. He took advantage uh, because he's my professor. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that means I'm going to squeeze the remaining two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, especially the one from the private sector. This government is always squeezing them. Um, Mr. Mutiaba. You are the uh, the lead. Uh, you are the president of the Sun Business Network in Uganda. I want to remind you about something. Uh, during a food systems summit, the dialogues, uh, Dr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General UN, told us that the private sector is actually the most important actor of food systems transformation in the country. So my man, you're very, very important. But now, uh, I've been following stories uh, of food fortification uh, in this country. Uh, you, as the private sector, I'm very sure that you you have constraints, but as well, there's something good you're doing for this country, but we are continuing also to see uh, micronutrient deficiencies still uh, high. Uh, you, you can talk to that. You may put your experiences to a uh, food fortification. I want to hear what you're doing as private sector towards food fortification in this country, I want you to show me the challenges you're experiencing uh, to deliver the nutritious foods that we want on the market. Thank you, moderator. Uh, my name is Godi from Tiawa. I was seated somewhere and you were calling me a priest, but uh, I'm Godi from Tiawa. Uh, so, uh, moderator has talked about food fortification. Yes, we know that food fortification started in Uganda in 2011, and uh, it started as a, a private, a public-private partnership 
whereby the fortifying industries were doing it voluntarily. Then later, mandatory fortification came in effect. And uh, as we are talking today in private sector, uh, fortification of wheat flour, which is produced, is mandatory. Even if you're producing one kilogram of wheat flour, you're supposed to fortify it. If you're producing maize and your meal capacity is more than 20 metric tons, you're supposed to fortify. And if your milling capacity for oil is 10 metric ton, you're supposed to fortify. As a contribution of private sector, as far as food security and nutrition is concerned, I'm proud to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, we have been fortifying since 2011 up to today. And uh, I must use this platform to thank the entire private sector for doing this willingly and also ably. So though we are fortifying and we have been fortifying for a quiet some time, I must tell you that there are some bottlenecks or challenges private sector has been facing. I was listening to the moderator, he said that uh, malnutrition is still a problem and persisting, but I must tell you that the private sector has done something as far as combating malnutrition is concerned, particularly in areas of fortification, but uh, the bottlenecks which are mainly curtailing us for maybe achieving what we would have achieved 100%, one of them is relying on imported fortificants. Ladies and gentlemen, it's absurd that we started the fortification in 2011, but up to date, we do not have a local manufacturer of fortificants in Uganda. As such, we rely on imported fortificants which are expensive. You can imagine, if I'm to give you briefly a business model, on a daily basis, fortification of wheat flour and maize flour costs 1.4, or on a monthly basis, it costs 1.4 billion. And fortification of cooking oil costs 2.5 billion. If you make a quick calculation, Every month, we spend 4 billion fortifying. But these 4 billion go out because you don't have any fortificant manufacturer in the country. Therefore, I implore Uganda Investment Authority, uh, I implore Minister of Health, Minister of Trade, and other line ministries to think about this, and also the development partners to help us have this maybe addressed. Another challenge we are finding in food fortification, we lack demand creation. Uh, we lack some policies which can help our products move very fast. There is a school feeding policy which has been uh, worked on for long by the means of education but uh, up to now, it is not yet finalized. And I also think we should have a public or institutional feeding policy. So once we have these policies, demand for fortified products, demand for quality products shall be in place. And once that demand is there, then we shall also realize value for investment as far as fortification is concerned. And also, as we are talking right now, I must tell you that in the country, we do not have a laboratory which takes vitamin A and some vitamin A, folic acid, and some other uh, micronutrients. As industries, we have been relying mainly on Uganda National Bureau of Standards, but for now they are not in position to test. We also got information that even some other 
private laboratories which were doing the testing are not in position. So as far as fortification is concerned, if we could address those bottlenecks, I think fortification in a country, specifically in industrial fortification, shall be augmented and thus improve the nutritional status of the country. Mr. Moderator, you told me to talk about only fortification, but as an industry, also we have other challenges, but uh, the onus is upon you to give me another time to talk about those bottlenecks. I thank you, but before I conclude, I must make you aware that most of us here have our children at school in boarding section. And as a child stays in boarding section for three months, for three terms, and those are nine months. If I say nine months over 12 months, that is 75% times staying in school. But are we monitoring what our children are eating at school? Are we monitoring? Do we know what our children are eating? No. And in Uganda, if I'm to use specifically my country, a child who started from around P4 to graduate takes around 15 years. But you can imagine your child eating unsafe food for 15 years because we don't have school feeding policy. Because, I mean, we have many challenges as far as food safety is concerned. But I once again implore uh, the Minister of Education to do something, come up with school feeding policy, finalize it, implement it, such that we can have our children eating safe food. Thank you so much, police. I didn't have to remind them to clap for you. It was obvious they clapped. Uh, he even gives you some recommendations. Oh, but <laughs> for 15 years, uh, you policymakers, your children are eating unsafe food. And you know. Uh, Mr. Tenua, uh, your boss should have been here to defend you, but you won't stand in for, for Mrs. Margaret Athieno. I know she has given you all the instruments uh, to, to answer uh, this question. Uh, you saw in the presentation of Madame Kamara showing how climate change is actually limiting uh, the deliverance of nutrition sensitive uh, activities. And then also uh, it was Dr. Tugume, he highlighted how climate change is increasing the incidence of pests and diseases uh, and very many uh, other challenges that you know. Uh, at the NPA, we review some of your budget, uh, we review your reports, uh, we've seen a lot of money coming towards your side uh, across. So we're now in program approach, the money can go to my youth, can go to water and all that. Uh, and now the interest of this meeting, uh, what do you plan to do differently? especially in the coming five years of the NDP4. As I speak now, the levels of Lake Victoria are rising and all these challenges. So what do you plan to do differently? And uh, what are you going to upscale? Because we are aware there are some good things you're doing. What do you want to upscale? So that these people in this room uh, can can adapt climate change, but also mitigate its impact. Uh, thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, I'm Emmanuel Tenua. I'm here representing uh, the Commissioner Climate Change Department. Uh, good afternoon to us for all good evening already. Uh, Mr. Moderator, you raised a very important question. And I'm glad that from what I've seen here, most of the work has already been done. And uh, it is clear to all of us 
that climate change has the potential to, to reverse or even hold a sustainable development within the country. But uh, for the interest of us here, I'll pick out about three key uh, things or actions that uh, we can upscale to make sure that uh, uh, we tackle the effects of climate change on food and nutrition. Uh, Mr. Moderator, and to, to us all, uh, as a country, we have uh, a national climate change action plan. I've always moved somewhere and people have asked me, do we have a plan for the country in terms of uh, managing climate change? Yes, it is there. It is phrased as the updated nationally determined contribution or NDC that has mitigation and adaptation actions that cut across uh, all the key sectors within the country. And most of these actions have already been mentioned by most of the colleagues from uh, Maif, uh, from uh, Makerere, and other presenters, uh, which include uh, uh, scaling up uh, uh, climate smart agriculture, sustainable land use management, uh, adaptive uh, livestock breeds, and then uh, also looking at uh, climate resilient varieties. But I don't want to go through all those actions. I'll speak to myself to what needs to be done from here. Now, according to the National Climate Change Act, uh, that is part two, all lead agencies and uh, districts must come up with a climate change action plan. And uh, I'm glad here we have uh, quite a number of uh, district local governments. And I can ascertain to you, moderator and participants here, it's only two districts so far that have climate change action plan. Uh, and that is out of uh, over 135 districts. So we still have something to do. Now, uh, the other key thing that can be done, a lot of actions have been mentioned here, but then how do we make sure that those actions are actually implemented? So uh, as the Ministry Minister of Water and Environment, the Climate Change uh, Department, and still this mandate is given to us within the National Climate Change uh, Act. We issue uh, a certificate of climate change compliance to all work, uh, work plans and budgets, both for the, uh, the programs within the uh, NDP, but also to the district work plans and budgets. And then what needs to be really emphasized is to make sure that we build the capacity at the local level, because the impacts of climate change are cut across, but in most particular, it's the grassroots communities that suffer the most. Why? They are more vulnerable. They are not like me and you. They are more, they have less adaptive capacity. So we have, uh, uh, we have the, the, the you, me and you have the duty to make sure that we build the, uh, adaptive capacity and also make sure that we increase uh, the resilience of our communities. Maybe lastly, uh, what I can mention here uh, is that uh, managing climate change uh, within across all sectors uh, in emphasis to food and nutrition, it, we have to take a whole of government approach or economy-wide approach. So me and you have uh, the work to do. Uh, Mr. Boderita, it's not just the means of uh, water and environment. As you mentioned, the money is not given to means of water and environment. I've seen very many people come to us with proposals. Uh, that one, I can assure you, we are all fighting for the same pot. Uh, as climate change department, we do the coordination role and also offer technical uh, backstopping. So Mr. Moderator, I will speak myself for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tenua. Give him a hand clap. Another one, please give him another one. There's a group there which seems very tired, but we are finishing. Uh, quickly, I want to attract only four questions, uh, two gentlemen, uh, two ladies, and then uh, not to me, but to the panel. Yes, four questions. Yes, number one. Uh, Two, 
Those are gentlemen are over. Oh yes, the questions can also go to the presenters. So that means I increase another. But now you can be five gentlemen. I mean five people, two gentlemen, and three ladies. Yes. So the, the gentlemen are already over. Can I see the ladies? One, two. Remaining the one lady. Am I, are you a lady? <laughs> Yes, okay. Okay, so you are the gentleman, the other gentleman I'm taking. Yes. So uh, we're beginning here. Give him the mic. You you indicate your name, uh, where you're coming from, and to the person you're asking the question. There are two gentlemen there. Yeah, when is the, yeah, he was number one. Okay, he can begin, then you give him. Okay. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ali Walter. Uh, I'm the director for King of King Match Investment and Consultancy Firm. I'm also the regional share person for SBN, Scaling Up New Visions, Business Network in Naturally Subregion. I must appreciate uh, my national chairs and all the panelists before us. Straight to the my question, question, please. Yes, yes. Most of these nutritional food actors are private sectors. Government workers cannot sell this product. What is that you have in plan to empower the private sector actors, especially the SMEs? small and medium enterprise, so that they still have the food fortifications exercise. Two, I wanted also to put this to the full profession. Last one. One question, please. Yes, last one. one. One question, please. Yeah, please, because we don't have time. You have to go home. Yes. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. I'm called Akeny Emanuel. I am the regional chair for SDN Lounge of Region. I'm the chair for Lao Grain Millers Cooperative in Langa. My question is going to the doctor from Naro. A lot of um, the discussions has been about uh, the deficiencies of micronutrients. And you have aptly stated that you have released about six varieties that are nutrient rich. But uh, doctor, you and I are aware that the uptake of these crops is very low. The orange flesh sweet potato has been in for a long time. The bean, the iron rich beans has been in for a long time. So I am asking, um, have we done a deliberate study to find why is the uptake low? And if the uptake is low, is it related to factors that research can continue to fine tune? For instance, is it about the palatability? Is it about the productivity? Is it about market acceptance? Is it about its resistance? To climate change, pests, and diseases, are these things the that should is clear. The question is really clear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. Where's the, uh, yeah, get to that lady. Good evening, young people. Once again, my name is Dorina Mumpire from Divine Organic Foods. And mine still is a recommendation to KCCA and National Water and Sewage Corporation, Madam, Madam Julie, about clean water and sanitation. Of recent, I was passing by Chisas. It had rained, I think it was on Tuesday, it rained a lot in the morning. And I saw, uh, it, it was like three people. I have a video in my phone. I don't know how to share it. And then they were disposing stuff in the trenches so that they were utilizing the opportunity of heavy rain so that they can throw garbage in the trenches. And then when you ask around what they tell you, the, the, the charges of garbage are high. You get, that's why people fear. That's what they are trying to avoid. Then 
a recommendation to national water and okay all of the parties we you should look at sustainable waste management disposal practices you encourage i don't know what project you can come up with but then think about it you need to find a way either you reduce on the charges because it's an issue i have a video i will find a way of sharing it so that it reaches the right stakeholders but then it's a very serious issue that needs to be addressed thank you find the other lady uh, thank you moderator um helen nansumba uh, coming in from the national health laboratory services and diagnostics so my question is more from the uh, pest, pest surveillance, but uh, 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 escalating it to use of pesticides in agriculture. So uh, as we monitor the uh, pests, who is looking at the pesticide views and also uh, its relevance in the human health and trying to understand what is uh, how commonly these pesticides are used in different areas of the country and even in the water sources for the fish and other water, uh, all fish or water sources. So trying to understand its impact in human health, not only in food, but now in, in human health. Who, who is uh, doing any work around uh, that, that we can uh, have this data? Thank you. Helen, who do you want? That question is for who? Uh, the first presentation, also Dr. Uh, Professor Kaya, and uh, uh, the presentation from Pest Surveillance. Any of the presenters can address. Thank you. Okay. It's behind there. Thank you so much. My name again is Bernard. As a nutritionist, I'm a little bit challenged, and I know my colleagues are also challenged. We are promoting vegetable consumption, fruit consumption, so that people can have access to these micronutrients we are talking about. But studies have also shown that so many of our vegetable categories that we have on the market are actually contaminated with uh, agrochemicals. And the dietitians and nutritionists who are here, you know, that would be good if someone consumed the fruit or vegetable when it is still a little bit not overcooked. So the community is also challenging us. You're telling us there are so many chemicals here and you're promoting us eating them. So what do we do? The Ministry of Water, someone was presenting on behalf of the Ministry of Water. Studies have also shown that there are agricultural chemicals in the water and the community is asking okay the water has chemicals the vegetables have chemicals and you want us to eat them so what do we do that is something that we need to reflect on uh colleagues there is a fruit and vegetable challenge going on i hope that each one of you is participating cutters of kamara daniel thank you so much i think professor kai and the team will be able to respond to how we deal with safety of the vegetables and the fruits thank you uh, thank you, Bernard, but you might join the exhibition team to pay the, 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 the money that, uh, for that advert. Yeah, so uh, my panel, you've had the questions. Uh, I think I'll begin from the extreme end. Uh, please uh, just start answering the questions that they gave you. Professor, you are the first one to go. Answer everything they have given you. After you, uh, Dr. Dorothy, uh, Dr. Zawede, like that. Thank you very much. Um, 
the issues on uh, pesticide residues, uh, who is actually monitoring and what should we do? Because we are promoting consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables as very good sources of micronutrients. True, I think the gentleman from Maif can answer um, about the monitoring, because uh, at least what I heard from that the, um, department is that they are doing a lot of training of our farmers and also extension uh, officers to make sure that they direct uh, farmers who are applying excessive, you know, uh, pesticides eh, to make sure that they follow uh, the guidelines, the dosage that is uh, quite often given. But uh, my biggest challenge actually has been uh, on the side of uh, retailers, because like for tomatoes, you know, uh, you have seen tomatoes full of that chemical, the whitish chemical, which is actually dated in 45 months of them. Uh, because the retailers demand that the, you know, they, they must see that chemical on tomatoes since they believe that the, it helps the, you know, to extend the shelf life or service shelf life, which is actually completely wrong. Because the, the, that chemical, the, the, you know, is supposed to offer its effect pre-harvest, before you harvest. So the business of uh, these traders spraying tomatoes when they are in the boxes is completely wrong. Uh, so the retailers need to be actually, you know, uh, informed uh, about mm -hmm. that. So they should uh, stop demanding, you know, the, the, the diseases that cause, you know, post -harvest, you know, uh, challenges are quite different from those that cause pre-harvest challenges. So I think they, that's very, very important. So while the, 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 uh, the ministry is putting emphasis on farmers, they should also go ahead and the, and the, um, you know, uh, sensitize the, the, the retailers. And if you look at the recommendations that we have put under, uh, you know, the game changer, uh, you know, uh, uh, regarding food safety and the, yeah, regarding food safety, definitely we mentioned about the use of, excessive use of pesticides and what the law should be. And the, the need for retooling the extension, you know, workers about to, uh, you know, the use of uh, pesticides. Uh, because we had, earlier on, we had recommended about the position of a food safety officer at the district level, but then the, 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 the structures cannot actually allow that. But we need that very, very, very much. It is indeed true. There's no way you're going to consume more vegetables when you're poisoning ourselves, you know, at the expense of getting the micronutrients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Or moderator, uh, I want to contribute to that. I want to encourage everyone here present that one of the strategies we can use to manage or to control some of the contamination is by is by us actually doing what we call urban farming or urban agriculture, where we. In our small plots, so in buckets or something, you plant some of what you have to eat. And the climate change team, as you're promoting tree planting, let's encourage people to plant fruit trees so that they can actually be able to manage what they are going to eat. We all have compounds. Why don't we plant fruits so that we can develop or we can have or we manage what goes on the fruits that we eat and what goes on the vegetables that we eat. We have cherry tomatoes, for example. Some of them are locally adapted. You do not need to use a lot of chemicals if you are growing them yourselves. And indigenous vegetables like nakati, buga, jovio. So let's try and consider that. Chair, I had a question on how why there is little uptake of the bio 45 products. I want to request Dr. Ankalubo to respond to that. So the person holding the mic, please give it to Dr. Ankalubo, who is the scientist that has developed the bio 45 beans. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Ankalubo, you are in the beans. I want to answer for sweet potatoes. It's okay. Okay, no very problem. good. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair um, and uh, Barbara and the team. Uh, my name is Inkalvo. I'm a bean breeder. Um, yes, the uptake. Uh, I'll start with the sweet potato. Uh, um, you asked whether the uptake is due to a couple of things, and true, it is. 
for the sweet potato initially, I think it was due to the low starch content. And as a team, we've addressed that. And I, I, the, the varieties that are on the market at the moment have the high starch content and a bit hard. Initially, they were soft, and people didn't like the soft uh, potatoes. So uh, that had a little bit of issue. Uh, but the other is really things to do with the seed system that is available. Uh, for example, for the vegetative, is from farmer to farmer. You know, it's a slow process, really. And it also goes to uh, the beans. Uh, we know our seed companies don't get a lot of money of, of soft pollinated crops. So accessing uh, biofortified beans is problematic, especially if the government doesn't involve itself in this thing. So it's really to do with the seed system rather than uh, the other things that we are talking about. I thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, private sector, <laughs> answer that question they gave you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, I'm my regional chairperson uh, asked what the government has done in order to help private sector increase nutrition agenda or promote nutrition agenda. I must thank the, the government of the Republic of Uganda through the Office of Prime Minister, Minister of Trade and other line ministries for establishing scaling up nutrition business network, which we abbreviate as SBN. Scaling up nutrition business network is a network which was posted by government and it is a network of private sector businesses which are dealing in a nutritious food products. And this network has a strategy which was developed. A national strategy was developed by Honorable Minister of Trade, Francis Mwebesa. He launched it in 2023, last year in June. And the, the objective of the strategy was three improve nutrition, food safety, and the quality of the food, and also increase forest advocacy, as well as increase accountability among the private sectors. This is a national document, enshrined from National Development Plan 3, and also Uganda Vision Action Plan Strategy 2.7, which talks about scaling up nutrition in the food industries. So I think the presence of this network, where I'm the national chairperson, and we are having different regional representatives throughout the country, I think this, would, this network will help us to see how we participate as far as police advocacy is concerned, and also knowledge sharing as uh, in terms of business to business is concerned. So that is what the government has done for us private sector. I think me as a chairperson for Scaling Up Nutrition Business Network, I can respond to that. But on the same note, I wish to thank our development partners who have enabled this network to go forward. I don't mean the other go forward. Remember the other go forward is some years back. I'm talking about the go forward of improving nutrition. I must thank KEA International, GAIN, World Vision, USAID, UNICEF. I want, must thank all the government MDAs because they helped us, they established this network and they are really moving us with advisory words and also support. Thank you. Thank you. Brother here, this man has done your job already. Yeah, he has thanked all the, the partners. Uh, Professor Mianja. Yeah, thank you, thank you, moderator. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, the chemicals you are complaining about. 
sometimes I tell people eating food is a risk. <laughs> you have to measure the risk. Uh, because of the climate change, that's why you see uh, spray, spray is becoming part of the agricultural system. And I'm telling you, you are not going to move away from that. The challenge we have is how we do it. Actually, agrochemicals are uh, hidden hazards. You don't see them, but they kill you, eh? that is. And the, another aspect which you have to know that uh, those chemicals, they bring food loss and waste, but not in Africa, but in European countries, because those guys are really strict on standards. They measure a minimum required, people call it maximum residue limit. That's the amount which is allowed there. So don't complain so much when you eat chemicals in the food. There's a standard which controls that. The problem, as we Africans, we go beyond. But there are people in Uganda who are doing a very good job. They control those levels. And they're able to export to European markets. So how do you copy from them so that other farmers can do exactly what others do? That's the challenge. But uh, Eating food is risky. You have to measure the risk. And I think when, he, for me, I told you I'm a farmer myself, I don't advocate for chemicals because I know the problem they cause. It does not mean that you have to spray all the time. But farmers, when they see one crop is affected, they spray the whole farm. That's wrong. Why don't you just approve that material and may it be incinerated, you were safer. Recently, I grow the, the entula, the white entula, you know them? Eh? The entula, you know the entula? Mm. I never sprayed them, even a single drop. That they grew and I sold them. But when I take them to market, exactly what the Honorable Kai is saying, they say if you don't spray them, they can't get a mango. They write very fast. But I don't believe that they can't get a mango because they are spread with chemicals. So we have to touch the mind of people. Even the consumers ourselves, you have a challenge to understand what you want. The moment you want tomatoes with those droplets of dice and 45, the farmer will continue to do it because you know there's what somebody's going to consume it. That's why I say, as long as there's a consumer of a bad food, there will always be a producer of a bad food. With the consumers, you have a big say to cut the chain, that is. And now on the side of the sweet potato, varieties, eh? People produce all varieties. For example, matoke, you know matoke. They did a lot of good work on matoke, big batches like this, but the test was zero. You know, producing a variety of matoke to fit in a certain environment is like producing a vaccine. You don't do it just immediately and you put on the market. It requires continuous research, even involving what? The consumer, the stakeholders. Because they're the guys you are going to test and say, ah, this is not very good. Then you go and manipulate your bionic, biogenetics and say, maybe in LPC will do this. Sure. Until you get it. Sure. So involve the consumers of your varieties mm -hmm. before you eject the, the variety in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I think food is a risk. I measure the risk. Dr. Tugume, give your answer, please. You got a question. Uh, then we then we we Give him a microphone. Uh, Maybe one here, one thing. So it's a caution. When you fear chemicals in your fruits and vegetables, what you do, you soak them in salt water overnight, and tomorrow you eat a bit free. That's the only way you can solve that problem of chemicals in your vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, for giving me another opportunity. And thank you for the person who asked the question about pesticide residues. We use pesticides to respond to pests. If there are no pests, there will be no pesticides. So um, that means the issues of pests and diseases need to be uh, taken seriously. Going back to the question, who is responsible 
for regulating pesticides in our food? The answer, I will give you two answers. One, almost everyone has been responsible. Minister of Agriculture is responsible. Minister of Health is responsible. Minister of Trade is responsible. Minister of Environment is responsible. And because of that, for a very long time, no one has been responsible. Yes, that's the truth. Because as agriculture, when, when, when the food reaches the market, it is a tradable commodity. Okay? So trade is responsible. So in brief, uh, the president, the ministry, they have noticed that the issues of food safety are serious. And that's why, despite the government going into rationalization, it has gone in, it has authorized the creation of the Food Safety Authority. Despite the mergers, it is but right now, the ministry is in final stages. The principles for creating a new authority responsible for food and food safety is going to be created. And it is going to be a responsibility of Ministry of Agriculture. So um, there is going to be a person now very responsible for food safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tugume. Uh, that, that brings it to the end of uh, our panel discussion. Give them uh, a final hand clap. Yes, I hand over back to Father Hilary to give the next. Hello, steps. hello, Mr. Buenje, there was a question. No, no, I saw you, our time has gone. You had a lot of elaboration. She will we shall continue the discussion, Madam Kamara, please. Okay. Thank you very much, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are touching a very uh, serious topic. And if we are not careful, we will sleep here. Uh, but thank you so much, everyone, for participating actively in this uh, last session, which, which has been uh, very, very good. Uh, we have been able uh, to correlate a number of variables, particularly pertaining to our topic, translating UNAP2 actions, implementing status of UNAP2 nutrition sensitive interventions in the agriculture sector. And we have been able to look at uh, the role of agriculture in nutrition the role of water in nutrition, the role of food safety in nutrition, and also the role of pests and diseases in nutrition. All these things are really are part and part of us, and we have to just find a way of uh, avoiding the worst scenario of how we can, uh, of how they can either affect us, how they can affect us uh, negatively. I'm just going to now lump together a number of, a few, a few issues that you have raised. Um, we have also now seen the progress and challenges in the implementation. This has been backed up very well by our presenters. Uh, they have backed it up with the data and evidence. We have seen a number of uh, partnerships and uh, collaborators in this whole, uh, uh, in this topic. We have seen challenges, big challenges, but also we have seen barriers. Uh, in, the addre in addressing uh, these challenges. We have also uh, 
had a number of future direction and recommendations. And certainly we have all participated well in coming up with all these things. Um, I'll just remind of us, us of a few things we have also come up with. One, this word looks very simple, but it is very good to have that, uh, that uh, these words repeated. If it is not safe to eat, it is not good. For me, I've got it. And uh, I think my my community will suffer if it is not safe. It is not good. Then we have been encouraged uh, from also uh, Professor Kaya to upscale irrigation, uh, to upscale the utilization of extension services. We have so many extension services, both in the government sector as well as in the private, in the civil society organizations. If we worked together and upscaled them, I think that would be very good. He encouraged us also to do price control mechanism and also do what he calls sustainable consumption of uh, of uh, the items we produce. Um, uh, when it comes to the, the presentation on surveillance, I think the core matter we go with is that Pests and diseases have no borders, and each one of us must be a, an apostle. I'm using apostle because I'm used to apostles. You can tell. So we are told that there is no pests eradication policy. And so the presenter encouraged us or encouraged the policymakers to formulate the pest eradication policy. When it comes to the contribution of water, environment, of course, the, the mantra is safe and clean water is the most nutritious food. That is our mantra for today. But also, uh, we are encouraged uh, in the promotion of agroforestry. So yes, the, 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 the ministry does that, but also all of us are supposed to, to do it, especially those of us with some pieces of land. And also encouraged us to do the hand washing, which highly helps in uh, food utilization. Um, She said that there is going to be an environmental court, and we are looking forward to seeing that court functional and active. Uh, there is another issue. We are invited also to advocate for food fortificant uh, industries in Uganda. So the, the presenter told us there are no food for current industries here. So we have we are called upon to advocate for that. And the, the responsible party, I think, will take it up. Um, there is, I think also we are in, encouraged to create a laboratory in Uganda which tests vitamin A in our in our products that we grow. Also, those who create policies are encouraged to create another policy uh, on school feeding, the school feeding policy. There is one more about 
food safety awareness, especially to the grassroots communities, people don't know about food safety. I was about also to ask a question, how do these people in the grassroots, the communities, how do they measure food safety? Some of them can't even measure. Uh, again, one of the panelists proposed the certification of climate change compliance. I think that's another good one that we can go home with. And then also the Minister of Water and Environment was encouraged to carry out sustainable waste management uh, system implementation strategies. There is also implementation, we are encouraged to implement multifaceted food safety, food waste, food distribution strategy, right from production to the plate. Uh, the professor here told us about all those things. Uh, also, we are encouraged to implement the food production zoning strategy. These things we have talked about even in the past, I think we are only reminding ourselves because some of these things have been coming. And uh, as I conclude, we have been encouraged for us who live in Kampala and other urban centers to implement urban farming in our compounds to avoid use of products uh, that are contaminated with our pesticides, uh, to train communities to control chemical use to the required standards, and also involvement of consumers in the production of biofortified products. There is one big problem, I think almost every presenter mentioned, is funding. Uh, I think that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's for, for all of us to, to think about. Thank you so much. You'll wonder why your father Hiller is the one chairing this. We believe that a healthy soul lives in a, in a healthy body. And if we priests run away from doing these things and supporting you, and just tell you to go to heaven, we shall not find you there. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for, for, for choosing me to be part of you today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. A big hand clap for Father, especially for reminding us how our souls and food come together. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have come to the end of the day, so what I'm just doing is to tell you how tomorrow would look like, and then we see how to uh, proceed from here. First, there are lots of videos and interesting things that have been captured, so they are going to be on the screen, so if you have a, a little time, maybe you are waiting for the jump to go down, you can still sit down and watch them, but also very early tomorrow, just before we start, they will be playing. Uh, today was a packed day, and unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to show all the videos that we have. Um, tomorrow morning, please be early, because the Prime Minister will be here. She will be coming to do the official opening of this whole week, uh, plus a number of other dignitaries, including some of the development partners, uh, who will be speaking in the morning and also uh, accompanying the Prime Minister. Um, in the afternoon, we shall then talk uh, about the point that Father, you know, sort of ended with, which is financing. So we will be hearing from Minister of Finance and others about innovative financing. So that's how, uh, you know, the rubber meets the road, as they say. So tomorrow afternoon, we shall invest time in not talking about how these things should come together, but also how we shall be financing them. But with that, we want to really thank you very much uh, for all the work that you have done and for staying this long. Uh, but again, we want to request that tomorrow by nine o'clock, we can kick off and, and make sure we don't lose time. Um, just...
Yeah. Okay. So they have also reminded me that there is an exhibition actually that goes with this that has some very innovative things that uh, was set up uh, and it will be uh, going on through this whole week. So please do uh, also visit that because these people have also invested time to bring their innovation so we can have a look at them. But with that, we want to thank you very much for coming today and we'll see you tomorrow at night. At school, I have learned that you can make a garden on a small piece of land, or that's in an urban area. We can make gardens in different ways, like in pyramids, baby towers, and also in some buckets. You can use a bucket, you put the soil, place the bucket well. Then after you put the seedling, you plant. Also, you can use sacks. When you get a piece of land, or that's in an urban area, you can put there a garden. I can plant a tomato, take care of it, and I make sure it is growing in a good way. But I can also try to understand the, the disease or any pest that is attacking it and I find a solution for it. Not only the Young Farmers members, but also the whole school, they always pick like, let me say like these tomatoes, they use it for frying the beans at school here. And also these other green vegetables, they always put in our food and people eat and enjoy. This project helps us a lot to learn more about food and nutrition and how we should eat the right foods. Children in our classrooms gain more energy when they eat foods which have these crops here. A healthy mind is a good mind for sure. When you are healthy, you can't fall sick. When you feed on a balanced diet, you are active, your body is active. Once a child eats good food, the brain develops quicker and faster. Children focus and we are, and we are performing better every day. Because of the need for proper feeding, sustainable feeding during the school, balancing their diet, not only the children, but even the teacher, this program came in really as a rescue for the school. Having these vegetables or these food additions in our, in our meals, it is making the children already appreciate what we are providing them. Mm. And it is adding value to their meals. When you go and look at the school gardens, we are actually telling people that space does not matter for you to be able to grow food that is nutritious to you. And the impact we are seeing is that when you go to these informal settlements or in tight spaces, people are now realizing that, oh, I can actually be able to convert this uh, chikutia, what they actually say, sweet, sweet, and grow something.